everybody. Today's episode is sponsored by Dip Your Car. Dip Your Car is your go-to resource for all your peelable paint products. From gallons to spray cans, they have exactly what you need. And check out their new HyperDip formula. It's a game changer. Yep, absolutely. It's hands down the easiest way to change the color of your car or black out your badges. Check out their website or YouTube channel for hundreds of how-to videos or just get inspired for your next car project. Thank you so much for sponsoring this week's episode. DipYourCar.com. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Origin Story where we dive into how your favorite YouTubers got started and where they are going. I am Mike. And I'm JP. And today our guest is Matt from Busted Knuckle Films. Matt, thanks for joining us. Appreciate having me, guys. Super Absolutely. stoked. Yeah, super stoked to have you on. In tonight's episode, we're going to learn a little bit about how Matt got started on YouTube and what he did before YouTube. So um, hopefully we can inspire someone out there to start a channel, get out there, and create. For those who don't know our guest, Matt Myrick is the man behind the channel Busted Knuckle Films. His videos are amazing, like literally mesmerizing. You're watching a truck going balls to the wall up this hill and you think it's going to fall and go crazy or you see some someone going like i don't know it, it looks like a hundred miles an hour through like a bog mud flying everywhere off road into the to the you know everywhere man it's a, it's you're gonna watch one video and then you're gonna get sucked down you know four or five hours i know because i did it today after even watching him before um and so his channel is home to over 750,000 subscribers on YouTube and Matt's 4,252 videos have been watched over 358 million times. Check out his channel for some amazing feats and some car content, uh, some building I'm guessing coming up and much more prevalent coming as we just talked about and check out his merch and his gear on his website. All that will be linked below. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Matt. We're really, really excited for this one. So let's start. Let's start with like where it started. What was the first car that you had? And does it relate to what you're doing today? Sure, yeah. So my first vehicle was a 1997 Toyota Tacoma four-wheel drive. Um, I basically bought it, started getting into off-roading a little bit, and went to college decided I, I actually lifted it and then ended up destroyed a little bit. I broke the whole front suspension and decided to solid axle swap it, which was quite the thing back in the day. And that was when all we had was forums. So I was like all over the forums trying to figure out how to do it. Me and my buddies in college helped me figure out how to do it. It took me like six months or so. And I finally got it completed. And then from there, we started wheeling it kind of all over, you know, the Southeast and around close to where we lived. And no one understood why or what I was doing because rock crawling and things like that weren't really a thing at that point. It wasn't mainstream. I guess it really isn't still, uh, but no one knew what it was. And I decided, you know, I had, I was in building science um, at Auburn university at the time. And for some reason I had this computer science class as part of my major. And one of our projects was making a video and I actually learned how to edit a video when I was doing that class and I was like man this is, really isn't that hard I started on like Windows Movie Maker and decided I was going to video everything for the next year of us out wheeling and having a good time and then make a DVD just so people you know our friends and family could figure out you know what it is that we were doing all the time and why we we're spending all our money on this hobby and and going out and beating on our vehicles and breaking them and doing it again the next weekend um, I made a DVD people started asking to buy copies and the rest is kind of history as far as the business it's pretty ballsy to do that to your first <laughs> vehicle right like you know like maybe you know you get your feet wet with like a jetta or a honda civic but no tacoma i love it i had a tacoma before my forerunner and i don't think i would have had the balls to just be like oh i'm gonna axle swap this i'm gonna do all these things to it because if i don't have it how are you gonna get the class how are you gonna do all those things you know right yeah well, lucky for me i had some really good friends uh one of them had a spare truck and I drove it back and forth to class and then would go over there and on the weekends and we had, I didn't even know how to weld. I bought a cheap welder from Home Depot and just like learned as I went. I had no idea what I was doing, but it turned out good and it never really broke. Um, I had a truck for a long time, but it kind of got me started in all this. And, every uh, every corner you take is squealing and, and you're going through tires like crazy on the streets with that. Were you driving it on the streets everywhere? Oh yeah, I was driving it everywhere, like yeah. tailgating, uh, football games and stuff like that. It, I drove it all over town, so yeah, I love that truck. 
I, I feel like oftentimes, and I, I grew up in Southern Oregon, so it's, I mean, I guess in a way, a little bit similar, but typically, you know, you get in a car, you get the truck, you start doing the off-roading. My first car was a Wrangler. Um, what about growing up? I mean, were you always around kind of dirt bike squads, um, you know, four wheelers? Like, what was that like? Because I know that's a pretty big influence on what you do now as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I grew up hunting and then, you know, always had four wheelers and stuff like that. My first four wheeler was a like Suzuki 130, had a duct tape seat and no suspension whatsoever. And the, uh, the people at the Cycle Salvage knew me by name when I was like eight years old because I had to come in there and buy like new spindles for it all the time because I'd be out in the, the pasture jumping terraces and stuff. And every once in a while, because it didn't have suspension, the spindle would just break. I'd have to go get another one. So uh, yeah, I, I learned kind of learned how to work on stuff from that too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we did too. We would, you know, we, if we had quads of four wheelers or we'd, you know, we'd always look in the ads and look in the paper, be driving around and see like a, a dirt bike for sale and we just walk up to the house and be like you know hey we want to be is that for sale i remember a guy was selling a, a 125 two-stroke uh at one point and that or no it was an 85 two-stroke and that might have been the most fun purchase that we had like three of us pool some cash together and that 85 uh liquid cooled two-stroke might have been the most fun purchase of all time nice. it absolutely ripped <laughs> um but just a lot of fun um doing that stuff and I, that's why i was curious of kind of where that came from because i'm sure you you and the buddies were, were doing that quite often when you guys were kids right yeah um so from there i mean you said the first video you made was in was in college so you did that in college did you did you video um the uh the, the, the solid axle swap in the tacoma or was that all before you were doing the video stuff that was before i was really doing videos that's kind of what like made me want to do a video so people would understand because I, I spent a ridiculous amount of money um trying to figure out how to do that i it, I did, uh, I could have done the cheap way and done leaf springs, but instead I did like cool springs and a three link. And like, it was all just reading on forums, trying to learn how to figure out how to do it all. And, uh, it actually, it actually worked really well. I don't know if I got lucky or if I knew what I was doing or I don't, I don't know, but it worked out pretty good. What yeah, forums were you using? Um, uh, I was using pirate four by four mostly. Um, okay. that was a big forum back in the day and had all kinds of tech information and stuff like that. And there was one just for Tacomas, um, back in the day that had a lot of good information, but there was stuff that I did that people had never done before. Like I used early Bronco cool springs on it cause it was kind of like close. And, uh, and I did a disc brake, took the disc brakes off the front IFS and put them on the rear and figured I had to do that. So it was a lot of cool stuff, you know, on the forums because of that. And that helped get me attention, you know, to my YouTube channel as well. And did you, so like that was your your first introduction was when you were at Auburn to this off roading rock climbing kind of like a uh, culture outside of you know hunting and riding maybe a, a, a ATV. Had you known about this community before you, you had gone to? Auburn? Um, I had I had seen a little bit of it. You know, around where we hunted, there was people that came and did the rock crawling stuff, and it was just it was never something that I thought I could afford to do. You know, at the time, of course, I was a kid. Yeah. Um, so, so I just, you know, saw it and, 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 and thought it was neat at the time, but, uh, but yeah, just saw a little bit of it here and there. And so you graduate from high school and you go to Auburn where you get a degree of, I mean, obviously you're born and raised in Alabama. Auburn's gotta be the number one school, maybe Alabama, right? And they're probably pretty close to like who wants to go where, but Auburn right. is a, a great academic school. And so you get a degree in building sciences, which is not an easy degree in any way, shape, or form. And it's, I feel like it's a, I never really heard of it until I worked in home technology and like lighting control. And it's becoming a very, very, very popular engineering degree. So why did you choose that path? Uh, so I grew up in construction. Uh, my family built houses the whole time I was growing up. So I, and I was like, you know, if I, I could take this and then do commercial, maybe it would be better because I wouldn't have to deal with all these homeowners. It would just be like a big commercial client. And then I graduated and I did that for two years and just like really didn't enjoy it. Um, I, I, I've always kind of been my own boss. I had two different lawn companies when I was in high school. I had a lawn company. And when I moved to college, I couldn't get a job at the lawn company. And so I just started my own down there. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I guess I just wasn't cut out for the corporate world anyway. So I started working on the film stuff a little bit, you know, on the side while I had my day job. And eventually it got to the point where I had to come to Jesus meeting with my, my boss when I got back from, uh, there's a big event in California called King of the Hammers. And uh, I went to that. And basically that was the, the turning point for me where I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do this full time and, and, and see where it goes. And yeah. uh, got what back. Year, what told, year was that? Uh, that was in 2011. 
Wow. Okay, so that was 2011. Yeah, um, it helped so that I'd already basically used all of my vacation time for the year in February. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes that decision a little easier, things. right? Cause, right. Because I mean, that's kind of the thing. You started, you know, your YouTube started in, in May seventeenth, two thousand ten, is when you started. So right. um, there's always this crossover point that every every guest that we bring on, we're talking to them about. Um, it's it's this. Well, you know, you're kind of YouTube and on the side. It's kind of a fun hobby. You're working like a main career, but you're trying to do something different. Um, where was I mean? When did you start? Were you already? I mean, based off the dates, you had been you started in YouTube. Were you making videos? Obviously, when you first started that job, and you were like, "All right, I'm doing the day job to kind of fund my passion." Or what did that look like? Um, I didn't really know. It was always one of those things I wanted to see what would happen with the the business. Um, and I just kind of I worked on it a little bit on the side while I had my day job. I didn't know how the day job thing was going to go either. It was just one of those things I was kind of seeing what stuck. And I uh, actually started following around kind of the more extreme side of off-roading, which is we call rock bouncers. And I uh, started a DVD series called Rock Rods uh, with those guys. And eventually I started taking those DVD trailers and putting them on YouTube. And that was the reason I started my YouTube channel was to put those DVD trailers on there to get people to see that and link to where they could buy the DVDs. Well, eventually the trailers started doing so well on YouTube that they were making better revenue than selling the DVDs. And then, of course, now no one buys DVDs. So everything kind of got moved to YouTube and, and uh, just kind of went with it from there. Yeah, it's better work. that you had that realization now because if you're still like focused on selling DVDs, it probably wouldn't be a good good opportunity for you. All right. You'd probably still be working and building signs. Right. Yeah, it's, it's just like anything else. I mean, technology changes and you got to pivot with it or you can be like Blockbuster. Yeah, absolutely. They so tried to pivot like, too late though. Too yeah. Late. yeah. Weirdly yeah, yeah. enough, I think the last Blockbuster is in Oregon, right? apparently blockbuster had an opportunity that i think it was to buy uh to buy netflix and i think they just didn't do it so those guys missed out big time um, yeah. oh that's yeah on them. that's on them um but so i mean back to the the work thing so you're kind of you're working you're doing the videos um you're doing that like where was that crossover point was it you know a year after you started the youtube you said you quit in 2011 um where where did you kind of see that crossover and what kind of what led to it i guess besides the just the dvd trailers and, and those type of things um i mean i definitely wasn't happy at my day job i'm, I'm much rather been out filming and, and going to these events and stuff like that and um, lucky for me my boss was pretty understanding for the most part you know in the beginning and then eventually you know towards when i was getting ready to quit i got a raise they like gave me an extra thousand dollars a year on my salary and they gave me like twice as much responsibility i was like this kind of sucks <laughs> that's, that's how they do it that doesn't add up that is exactly how they do it and i was like i don't even want the extra money like i just want an extra week of vacation like i don't even i don't even want the money and they're like we can't do that and i was a like thousand, this, a thousand this is bucks is like 26 dollars a week or something stupid. yeah <laughs> so i was like so you so you mean to tell me you want me to work for an entire year and have two weeks of vacation it's like no nah, that just doesn't sound right <laughs> so eventually i just got fed up with it and you know saw the opportunity and, and i at that point i was doing dvds and i would go home from work and i worked an hour away from uh uh, from where I lived so once I got home I'd you know I'd work until two o'clock in the morning and get up at five and go to work again and so I mean they probably thought I was on drugs or something because I was so tired all the time but uh, yeah. it was hard for a long time to to sit there and try to balance both of them and then got to the point to where I had to choose and uh, yeah. you know of course you can always go back to a day job or get an opportunity somewhere else with that but you don't have you only have so many choices to really take a chance on on you know following your dream. And, yeah. and how did you, how did you come to that chance? Like, so obviously you, you started YouTube, you were making DVDs, you're, you're building a community through, I'm guessing through like the forums and things like that. You start to get traction. What were the factors that went into your mind other than like, obviously if I make this choice, I'm going to be much happier. I'm going to have as many vacation days as I want because I am my own boss. But like, what were you, what were you putting in, in line to say, if I hit this milestone or if I do this, or was it just, you got back and you saw the community that you were with in California and you're like, that's, that's what I want to do. Right. It, it was mostly that. And then of course, like I said, when I got back from that California trip, my boss brought me into his office was like, look, you know, you're going to have to decide either you want to do this side business thing or you want to work here. And I just, that was just the point for me where I was like, all right, this is a sign that this is my opportunity. This is the time where I need to just go ahead and, and, and go full time. And, and if it doesn't work out, that's fine. But at least I tried. And so I basically, from that point forward, I put everything I could into it and, and haven't really slowed down since. Yeah. So yeah, I bet it, 
if he looks at it now, he's probably like, okay, I get it. Yeah. It probably makes yeah. no sense so now, but the, a lot of people don't quite understand um especially a lot of youtubers kind of pursuing this dream it seems like people are like well you got a good job you're doing this like why waste it you know was he what you i mean you said he's pretty understanding was like was he basically like all right man go, go chase the dream or did he also not get it um i don't know if he really got like the the boss i had before him like definitely understood and would like give me a break and you know let me have the weekend off or whatever so i could go to an event and stuff like that that was important but this one really didn't didn't really get, get it the same. So uh, so it was a little a little easier to to take that chance and, and make that leap. Yeah. I want to pull back to to college real quick because I think you said something earlier when you were kind of going through the path early on about you know you were in college, you took an opportunity to make a, a video class, and that's where you got the fundamentals to what you're doing today. But like you know, it sounded like you were already, you know, when you're going out with your friends, rock crawling on the weekends and doing things like that, you were already bringing a camera. Why, why was the choice uh, to bring this camera with you? And what, how did you, how did you even think like, oh, I'm just going to bring my, because this was not a thing then. Right. <laughs> it was, it probably was, but it wasn't what it is today. You couldn't shoot in 4k, like 240 frames per second. Right. So I don't know if that's a thing. I made that up. JP, you can yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, our um, first uh, first camera, a buddy of mine that wheeled with me brought it. I don't even know. It was like his family's camcorder. Brought it and started video with it. And then the first one I ever had was like one of those Sony ones that had the little mini discs in them. Yep. And uh, and we just I just brought it with us. And we just wanted to be able to like, you know, it was something to remember the trips, you know. So you could show everybody when you got home, the people that couldn't make it on the trips and, and show everybody the stuff that you went up and conquered and things like that. Because that's what it was all about back in the day because we were building these things to conquer obstacles and you know if i took my vehicle that i built myself and made it up this pretty well-known obstacle then you know you want to show that off and so that's why we started doing the video stuff because the trails have like grades right the, the things you're going yeah. on have grades and there's like it's kind of like rock climbing right where you know you're gonna i don't know i went rock climbing once with uh, my friend drew in like uh where were we west virginia and all the all each route had its own grade it was like 5.9 or something and i'm gonna guess it's the same thing you you built this truck you put all this effort into it and then you just conquered something that's really difficult so you wanted to have it for both memory's sake and to show all your friends like you said Is that right. right yeah and then the biggest thing with with this and, and starting a youtube channel like i never got into videoing or any of that stuff because i thought it could make me money like I got into it because I enjoyed it. And like the more I started making videos and was able to show other people what we did, the more I enjoyed that. And so, you know, I think that's a big, a big thing that people miss the point of when, when they start YouTube channels and things like that. Like if, you know, it's very difficult in the beginning, like when you have, you start out with a, you know, no subscribers and you build your way up, like it sucks because you're putting the same amount of effort in then than you are when you have, you know, a million subscribers. And so, yeah. but you're, you know, you need different results. So it's one of those things that it's a lot of work. So if you don't really love it, then a lot of times people fade away pretty quick in it. So yeah. how long did it take you to hit like your first YouTube milestone? Um, I don't even know a long time, <laughs> but you have, you have the number one amount of videos that I've ever seen on any of our, like we're ep this is episode 56, I think. And you have at least two if not three times more videos than the next person who's been on the show you have four thousand two i don't want to jump too quickly into uh to youtube if you have anything else jp but um you have four thousand two hundred and fifty two videos posted on your channel that we've yeah. seen right like there's probably hidden videos i guarantee it right, right. Videos it removed the big thing is, is we were always trying to follow the algorithm too. And that's a big part of, of social media in general is you gotta, you gotta do what the algorithm wants. And in the beginning, YouTube was all about that short clip that got a bunch of views, you know, yeah. that whatever the craziest thing that was that happened that weekend, that's what you put on YouTube. And that's what got all the views. And now eventually it got to the point where it was more, they want it to be like TV where you had episodic comment content and things like that. And so that's why we have, the big number of videos is mostly because we started out, you know, at one point I was doing a video, two video every day uh, for a long time. And now we will put out one, two a week, but we also went from 30 seconds piece to, you know, 20 minutes or more a piece. So, yeah. It went from quick little flashes to, Hey, these are whole pieces. This is a whole event, which kind of brings right. it back to, you know, another piece. I mean, kind of even before YouTube's happening, before you really start to do a lot of the filming, 
is getting involved with those communities. And it seems like what you follow, while a lot of it can be similar, it's a lot of different communities, right? You've got the, uh, what do you call it? The rock bounce was, you know, there's all, there's all these different genres that you cover. I kind of fall under this umbrella of this kind of more extreme off-roading um, or hill climbing or mud bogging or whatever it is. But like, what was it like getting into those communities and like, how, how did you get involved with them? Cause it seems like, I mean, you're up there. Everybody knows you, I think at this point. Um, but back yeah. then, you know, how did, how did you get into those communities? What did that look like? I mean, that's, that's kind of like the legwork that you put into the YouTube channel that people don't see. They're like, Oh, I just want to make YouTube to make money. It's like, well, you were in with the community before you started ever doing anything big on YouTube. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. That was probably the most difficult thing was, you know, no one knew where these guys were going and riding. Like now they got full like sanctioned race series and things like that. So, you know, if you're a, a decent filmmaker, you can come in there and video and, and you know where everybody's going to be. It's no problem. Well, when I started, these are just a group of guys that went out trail riding, you know, on the weekends. And unless it was a popular event or you knew somebody that knew somebody, you had no idea where they were going to be. Sometimes it was just kind of luck of the draw. Um, and, and I was lucky to have a few of the bigger parks, you know, within two or three hours of where I was going to school. So, uh, and, and when I got out of school where I lived, it was still fairly close. So just lucked out right place, right time a few times. And the, the more I got hanging around, the more they'd see their videos on YouTube and that would help them get sponsors and things like that. And so it's kind of worked out and they started saying, Hey, you know, we're going here on this weekend. Do you want to come? And so I was the, the crazy kid with a camera that would hop on the rear axle of their buggy and, you know, ride with them down the trail so I could get to wherever it was to, to take videos or take my truck. Or I had a four wheeler at a time that I was, uh, I had a 400 EX uh, sport quad that I was chasing these guys around with 43 inch tires and rock bouncers and trying to keep up with them so I could film. So it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of work in the beginning. There's plenty of times that I'd slept in my truck cause I couldn't afford a hotel room and things like that. So yeah, everybody has to start somewhere. Good. That's, that's what I, I find interesting too, because, you know, you have to get into these communities, like what you're doing. If you just tried to show up and you were like, you know what, I want to be the YouTuber that covers this. Like, you're not going to be, you know, everyone's going to know you don't really belong there, but because you were in that community and you kind of built yourself up and helped these people out, you became kind of an, an ambassador almost like a YouTube right. ambassador in a way for all these videos where if somebody's doing something crazy or they're, you know, very good or technical at whatever, um, you know, activity they might be pursuing, you're kind of the ambassador that, that helps them out probably gets you into the community even even further right and then a lot of that was uh why i started the cold clothing thing too is you know all these guys that i was videoing were like they want to do something to help me and give back or, or whatever because i mean i was just a kid chasing a dream at that point and so i made you know the first t-shirt with my logo on it and uh you know started bringing them to events people started buying them and stuff like that just to kind of help me out and uh, the whole kind of clothing brand was born from that because there wasn't anybody that at that point, people were just wearing shirts of companies that made products for off-road. There wasn't anybody that had like an off-road clothing company. And so we kind of started something from that. And uh, the biggest thing that probably helped me the most in the beginning is, you know, I was in college when Facebook started. And so I was one of yeah. the first people with a Facebook account, you know, once it made yeah, it to all EDU. the colleges. Once you, know? you got the EDU, you know, the EDU email, that's how it right. should still be, I swear. But I like, agree. That's same, same with me. I got <laughs> Facebook. When I started, you had to have a .edu, no parents, yep. no nothing, no, no weirdos. Um, you had to be a college student. Those were the days, man. That was the best. Right. And so eventually they got to the point where you had, you could have a page. And so I made a page early on for the film company and everything. And, and you know, was putting good content on there and, and linking the YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. And it just grew a lot. And that's why we have, we have two and a half million followers on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, well, So that helped a lot too. So like basically anytime social media starts, I mean, we, when TikTok started, we made an account on there and started posting content, Instagram, same way, Snapchat. Like we just put the content everywhere because you never know where you're going to get the next thousand subscribers to your channel, you know, and like TikTok right now is a big driver for us. Yeah. That's, I want to pull that's back interesting. To well, I was going to say that just real quick. That's interesting yeah. too, because being, you know, I, I'm curious, just your personal thoughts. Did you ever like, did you, were you like, ah, TikTok, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> or were you thinking of it like business opportunity? Like, yeah, we're hundred percent going to get on there. Yeah, I mean, usually I'll, I'll be a little reserved when something new comes out, but there's just something about TikTok. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff about, you know, different things with social media to try to keep in the loop. And uh, that was one that I was just like, I jumped on board fairly early, um, you know, once it started kind of making waves. But I, don't, I, of course, don't get on there and do dancing videos or anything like that. I'm, I'm the guy that posts, you know, crazy off-road content on there, and that's the differentiator for us. And, yeah. and so well, it works out pretty well, good. Not that we've seen the dancing videos. They I could was about to say. We don't know. <laughs> um, no, but, 
but the uh the, i think it's funny because tiktok in a way and, and and the way youtube's going now with like their short stories and stuff too it kind of plays well to some of these rock climbing things where people are it's a quick run it's actually it's not a bad way to get your type of content out there um just from a quick snip you know perspective it i want to go back to what you kind of said about like how you've adapted to each one of these social medias like you you just talked about adapting to tiktok talked about joining facebook early on and seeing this as a business opportunity to promote at that time i'm guessing the dvds and the sale of dvds you were early on um in the short clip phase which is now full circle coming back with right. stories on youtube <laughs> and you know you you've you followed these kind of changes with social media and how do you determine what trend to jump on and how do you determine which ones are not because it's weird to see someone who made dvds as videos like full-on movie films and films go to short clips which i look at your top five you know all of them are under 10 minutes which up until the last year would have gotten you no monetization on those videos. And, you know, now you're making, you know, 17, 18 minute short movies again. So it's cool that you've kind of, you get to go in these cycles, but can you talk us through about those cycles and how you make choices through it? Sure. I mean, you, it's pretty easy to see like with analytics, especially like all, most all the social media platforms at this point have really good detailed analytics. And, and that's something that really sets us apart as influencers and not people that are doing like television shows and stuff like that. It's like, we can actually see how many people and where they're from and all that stuff. And that, that stuff, the statistics you get off television shows and stuff. I, I can't believe that people still sp spend money on TV ads. Blows my mind. But uh, yeah, I mean, you see the analytics and you see what works and what doesn't, you know, well, a lot of times you can't, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect the same results. You know, at some point there's going to be a change and change in the marketplace and, Eventually, people might want short videos on YouTube again. We might start doing that again, but we just kind of follow what works. And, and I follow a lot of other channels and see what they do. And, you know, another thing that's really neat in the last few years, especially on YouTube, is people have gone from they want like really nice, like quality edits and like graphics and crazy stuff like that. And now you got people watching like Cletus McFarland and all he does is walk around and video on his cell phone. And so a lot of it, and that, <laughs> that was a hard thing for me. At, also, at one point, you know, I didn't, I never wanted to be the guy in front of the camera. That was never my intention. I, I didn't want to do that. I was not comfortable in front of the camera. And so I was just videoing the people out there that were showing out and doing their thing off road. And then it came aware that at some point I had to get in front of the camera so people could get to know me as a person and who the creator was and things like that. And, and uh, that's worked out really well for us as well, you know, because people get to know you and, and care about what you're doing and your story and stuff like that. And so it's one of the things you got to continue to continue to pivot and, and change things up or else, you know, you get stagnant and, and go the wrong direction. Yeah. One of the most important things that we're seeing um, is just being, you know, it's the, the people are interested in your channel, but they're also, they're interested in you and what you're doing too. So it's, yeah. you know, having that is i mean that's that's ideal the the followers get more insight into who you are what you're doing um it's actually why we do these podcasts to be honest i mean it's it's to get to understand you and have the viewers as well kind of like give a voice to the viewers and, and kind of show what they might not know about you right but um bring them in close that's a that's a good way to go um gosh i was just thinking me and mike and i were just talking about this earlier today uh because peter mckinnon just dropped a video and he said well here's he's like i just did an example and if i don't know if you follow him, but he's like, I, I just did a, a full edit, like pro shot video of this coffee maker. And then he's like, then I just did an iPhone cut. And he's like, I did it on Instagram, TikTok, Instagram stories, YouTube, YouTube stories, and kind of found his results. And it's really interesting where he's getting, you know, 500,000 views in a day on TikTok from a quick iPhone edit. Yeah, That's kind of the dilemma we're in right now, where there's a little bit in between. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I love about your channel, your audio is always great, great audio. So I don't know what kind of microphones you're using, but it works. It comes through nice. Uh, it's actually super simple. I had, I run Canon cameras and there's a, they make a mic that goes on that Canon camera. It doesn't have its own battery. It works off the camera with the camera. And those are the only ones I've ever used. And for some reason, they're the only camera or the only mics I could ever find that I didn't have to set up or do anything special. And they never distorted when someone with a, 600 cubic inch big block and straight headers is you know revving right by your microphone and so that's always worked out good for us you know using that stuff when you yeah. can't there's so many videos that i know of you know where someone does have the battery powered mic and they're at the bottom of the screen you see something happening I, i'm thinking of like a couple bikers that i watch 
and it's you see someone doing something crazy at the bottom. It's, I forgot to turn the mic on. So yeah. for the audio. And then 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 they're over, you know, voiceovering. And it, it's good that you find the, the simple tech. And I feel like that kind of go, probably goes back to your roots of you don't want to create anything too complex when you're going rock crawling, because if something breaks, you've got to be able to fix it somewhat to a point in the field. And right. in the field that you're in, <laughs> you don't have a lot of garages in you know, rock crawling's area. You have a lot yeah. of people who are smart and engineering focused like you, you know, like backwoods engineering in that sense. But um, yeah, you, you don't have the modern tools to do it. So you can't just pull out an extra battery or something like that while you're out there. Right. And I've learned the hard way, you know, along, along the years as well. You know, I had the, the uh, Sony, whatever disc player thing that had the little mini discs in it. And half the time they wouldn't even, the footage wouldn't even be on there when I put it in the computer and crap like that. So <laughs> and I had a, a Rode video mic that had a battery in it and it would store and then the battery would die. And so like, I've made all the mistakes. So I, I know what works and what doesn't. And the thing that's always funny is we'll have TV shows and stuff every once in a while come and shoot some of the races and events and things like that. And they'll just bring these guys in with, with these massive cameras and, and jibs, cranes, like all the crazy stuff. And I'm like, this guy's wearing a backpack. And he's got this $10,000, $20,000 camera in front of him that's like on a, a thing over his head. And I'm like, if this thing comes at you, are you going to be able to run? Because I'm going to run because I got this little cheaper camera. And I'm going to be fine, but you're not going to be able to run no, <laughs> with that big camera like, on your back. Yeah, when you yeah, see one of those, uh, yeah, when you see one of those dirt bikes or quads flying up, uh, you know, doing a hill climb and that thing shoots up off the top, you can be able to get out of the way. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, that, that's the experience. And the funny thing is, is those guys will show up and do that whole thing. But you look at the numbers and you're probably going to be getting more views out of, you know, that handheld, good shot. You know, the community, you got a good spot up on the hill um, right. or wherever you might be filming from. Yeah. It makes um, a big difference. So you started this in 2006, like this is when you started to make this and to do videos. And so you've hit a lot of milestones over this time, including uh, 44 videos over a million views. Nice. That's, that's, that's a lot. Honestly, insane. Like that's more than <laughs> mo like it's, it's huge. You have three videos over 20 million views. You have 753,000 subscribers and growing. Talk us through a little bit of those milestones, like first million view video. How did that feel? What was it like? First hundred thousand view video, or like all those little milestones that you, not little, they're all amazingly huge, but right. you know, how, when you hit it, the, your first hundred thousand subscribers, your first 10,000, what was that like when you were doing it? Uh, it was wild. I mean, when we hit the first hundred thousand subscribers, it was, it was huge and it wasn't really that long ago. And it's crazy how stuff like that builds on itself that much more. Like you, you go from getting, you know, a hundred subscribers a week to getting a thousand subscribers a week. It's just crazy how that stuff builds. And it's just, it just makes you, it just drives you as a creator. It makes you want to work harder and get better content. And it's just kind of, it's kind of addictive in a way, um, you know, being a creator because, you know, you just kind of keep getting that, that shot of, of dopamine when you put a video out and one does really good. So you work really hard, do another one. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. But the, the funny thing is, the ones that we expect to go viral never go viral. It's the, it's the ones that are like, ah, I don't know if this will be good or not. Let's put it up there anyway. And those are the ones that go viral. Like, I, I don't understand the recipe. I guess if I did, I'd have a lot more <laughs> subscribers. But uh, we What's, just... Uh, you, yeah. have, you got a good example of one that you thought would have gone viral but didn't? Because that's, uh, that's always interesting to reflect back on. You're like, oh, this is definitely going to get it. Yeah, we had one recently that I just really thought would do good. Um, <laughs> we had this guy go with us on a trail in Moab, Utah, in his razor. And we knew this guy was going to break something. We had already given him the pep talk that if you break, like, we're going to continue on and do the trail and we'll come back and get you later. But we're not going to stop because you break because we know you are. Anyways, he breaks middle of the trail. And this is miles in the canyon in Utah and no way to get it out. He broke the steering and all kinds of other stuff. And so he calls this guy Great. with a off-road wrecker and an off-road trailer to come get him and recover him out of this place. This thing's got, it's like a, you know, but, uh, square body Chevy dually with big tires and winches everywhere. And so I video this whole thing, this whole recovery process and everything. You see a lot of videos on YouTube from people doing recovery and, and they get a lot of views and we put it out there and I was like, man, this one, I think this was going to do good. They got like, I don't know, 11,000 views. <laughs> 
So you just never know. And then I'll, right, right. I did That's a video something. of me. I've got a, a six, seven power stroke diesel that came with a 26 gallon fuel tank in it. And it would make it about 200 miles when I was hauling a big trailer, you know, across the country. And I got a company to give me a good price on putting one of their auxiliary tanks in it. It's like 55 gallons. Whoa. And I did a video, you know, just cause of that. I didn't want to do a video on it, but I did a video. So they gave me a discount and uh, that video got like half a million views. I never expected it. I, I kind of half-assed shooting the video and editing it and everything, but it got like half a million views. So it's one of the things like you never know what's going to catch on, especially with, we've kind of tried to hit everything. You know, we do the action, we do the build stuff. We do the tech videos. We kind of hit everything. And the funny thing about tech videos is they never just like shoot up right at the beginning. But if it's something that becomes, you know, very popular, that it might it might shoot up, you know, a year later after you've done the video. So, and then you know, you got race content and crazy stuff that you know usually gets, you know, quite a bit of views right in the beginning. Yeah, like yeah. you're always going to get crashes and stuff like that. Yeah. Are always going to pop up those big crashes. Right. Everything that you film, like you're going to get a quick pop out of those. It's funny to see the longevity of those evergreen ones. We're like, hey, here's this vehicle. Here's how we fix something on it. Because as people start to acquire them later on and try to like you know, YouTube it and figure out, Hey, how do I fix this? Or how do I do this? Now, all of a sudden they're starting to trickle in. Right. These and the big thing with tech videos and things like that is, is I feel like ours are good because I mean, I'm not a professional mechanic. And so I'm figuring it out while I'm videoing. And so it makes it very detailed. And for someone that's a novice, you know, for that stuff, kind of like I am, it makes it where they feel like they're comfortable, you know, doing and it answers the questions that they're going to have just because I had the questions because I didn't know what I was doing. But I think so for all my trucks thing. don't run, so that's good. Yeah, the same thing that you said about the the auxiliary tank, like it might be something that you didn't think was going to be something great, but the reality is I'm sure a lot of guys and gals out there who have the similar problem, like, oh man, I only make it 200 miles. I can't, I can't stop every like two hours, three hours to get gas. How am I going to fix this? They type in like auxiliary tank and yeah. whatever Chevy Suburban or whatever they're driving. They see this video like, okay, I get it. I'm going to do this. It, it's a solution to a problem that has to, and I'm sure the, I'm sure like if you look at your analytics, the view time on that video is significantly higher than some other videos too, just because yeah, yeah. the people who are searching those keywords are going to watch the whole video. Right. So I don't know, but I, I agree. It's like, okay, you make this video. Why? Okay. <laughs> yeah. What, what is it? So it's interesting right. to see how the algorithm rewards right. and doesn't. Yeah. I was just trying to search for the, um, when you put the injectors in the 7.3 liter, um, yeah. trying to find that old video. Cause I'm sure I want to, I'm curious what the views look like on that because that's one where, I mean, everybody loves those 7.3s now. Um, I was just curious to see what the views were on it. Yeah. When we were looking at that, the, the company was like, yeah, we're on board. We'll give you a set of injectors for this truck. And then the guy was supposed to come down and help me do the install. And I was going to video it <laughs> Well, he just like something happened and he couldn't go. And so he's just like giving me the, the information over the phone. And like, I'd swear I called him like 20 times while I was doing that video, but that video has got a ridiculous amount of views. And I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of sets of injectors that company sold because of that. And yeah. there wasn't a good video at that time of how to do those injectors on that truck. And it's very, it's, it's pretty difficult because I had no idea what I was doing, but it's another one that it was a good video because I didn't know what I was doing. So I got, I gave very detailed information because I was learning while they were learning. I think yeah. people love that. As a car guy that I do a lot of like, you know, I do a lot of my own work when I can. And it's like, all right, well, I need to find a YouTube channel. It's like, all right, this guy's like, I like the guy who's like going through the struggles um, and being like, well, okay, well, this is, you know what you need to do. You need to remove this first because I didn't realize that I need to get to that. As, a, right. as somebody who's fixing something like, oh shit, that's definitely what I'm going to do first and make sure that I'm not uh, messing it up. But no, I like that one. I remember uh, when you turned it over and like the big puff of white smoke came out, you're like, that's probably just fine. <laughs> like, that's probably just something else. Don't worry about that. It's still going. Yeah, so how, no, do you, how do you come up with ideas for your content? Like what do you, obviously, you know, like the schedule of big events that you're going to go to. So there's, you know, I don't know how much content you get out of those, but like now that you're, you're introducing the building on your channel, not just, you know, I don't want to call it like third party, but friends and families, vehicles and people at these events. Now you're starting to bring them closer to the channel itself. How do you determine, you know, what's too much content in the shop versus too much content on the trails versus the mix? Like, how, how are you going to determine that? And how do you determine it going forward? 
Yeah, we, we try to make a good mix of everything. I never I never try to put out like just multiple videos of the same content in a row. So like I'll there's times where I'll be really busy and for a month I'll do a bunch of different events and trail rides and all kinds of stuff and we'll do a build the process and all that. And I'll take those and we'll just we'll just have it all scheduled out to where we'll edit a trail ride video for this one and then build here and then you know a race video here. And so we try to keep it all fairly mixed up. So that way you're not just getting the same content over and over again. Now, I want to pull that thread a little bit more because earlier you said like the series are big now. So yeah. if you were to start to put in some series content, which you have some series, um, like I'm, I'm looking here just quickly, you know, like episode 22 of the El Camino and things like that, the series, like how do you, how do you determine like, okay, it's been this much time I need to add to this series and that series how do you track all this information as well <laughs> oh that's just in my head i guess uh, so the, <laughs> the, the death death wish thing was was that one's a pretty good story um i i met this guy josh Mazarol. um i had been watching his instagram stories of all the crazy stuff that he does in these vehicles and he basically builds these rat rod type vehicles and kind of scraps them together and then he does like really dumb road trips and then like things like it's like watching a car crash because you know he's gonna run out of gas he's got no fuel gauge and <laughs> he's like halfway built this thing and he's just gonna drive across the country and so I, I i always thought he was so funny on the the instagram story stuff and so i got to meet him at an event and I was like, man, you know, you just need a camera crew following you around all the time. I was like, man, I tried that. You know, I started a YouTube channel and I just, I just didn't want to do all the editing and stuff. And I was like, look, I got a spare camera. I'll send it to you. I'll give you some pointers. Just film what you can film and then send it to me. We'll edit it and maybe we'll make something cool out of it. And so the very first episode of that, and this is one where I thought something would go viral and it did go viral, but they went and found a, lawn, a guy that was like in the next town over that had a street bike powered lawnmower they could do wheelies and this guy said yeah you want to come over and drive it i'll let you drive it and so that was basically you know the start of the death wish show and he went over and drove it and of course you know he was flying around on it they only got up to like third gear and the the, the shot that i knew was going to be the one was the guy at the very end like no helmet no nothing just freaking rips on it pops a wheelie and wrecks off of it i'm like this is it that's the thumbnail this is going to be the video and like this is going to be a thing and that one went viral and i just it was one of those things i just when when i was watching the edit i was like this is going to go viral there's no way it won't and it did so that that's a good series and i just try to keep we try to do one of those a month of course he's always he's got a crazy schedule and always doing stuff all over the place and so we try to do one of those a month and and uh, it works out pretty good we actually have that series on amazon prime as well and it's done really well on there Oh, awesome. Oh, that, that is a, that is a, I'm going to put that down as a note. So I also yeah. want to talk a little bit about like uh, the, these, is this like a strategy for you? Cause obviously YouTube is not like corporate America where there's a traditional retirement plan packages that you're putting in a 401k <laughs> at the end of it, you get a you know, 50 years, you know, of thousand dollar raises a year. And uh, at the end of it, you get a cake, a tap on the back, and then they forget about you the next day. Um, what is this? Is this like introducing these series like Death Wish and other people onto the channel? Is this part of you diversifying and building a community to help grow or what's the goal here? Um, I think that was, that was mostly to diversify what we were doing. Um, at the time when that kind of came about, it was when Roadkill, which is one of like one of my favorite shows that was on YouTube, it was yeah. produced by Motor Trend. It's when they like pulled all their stuff and started doing where you had to pay for it. And I was like, man, there really needs to be somebody that can do like roadkill type stuff, but it'd be on YouTube still. And that's basically like what he fit. And that was something that it's not off-road content. We've gotten to do some off-road stuff, um, but it's not always off-road content. It's just something that's, that's different. And he's all about, you know, finding strangers and, and showing that there's still people out there in the world that are willing to help you and do everything they can, you know, when you're on a road trip that, you know, it's not what the media makes everything out to be like everybody out there is bad. Like, there's a lot of good people out there on the road that are willing to help. And good. so yeah, exactly. there's a positive Definitely down in the South. Yeah. 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 I, got, I mean, I got a good question for you too. I mean, I, as you start to film these and you start to go, you know, as you start to build your YouTube career, um has it always been you filming and editing and kind of putting those together um from the start and then where are you at now is it is it still just you doing the editing and filming 
Um, so to start with, it was all me doing absolutely everything and whoever I could talk into holding a camera for me at the time. Um, <laughs> now I have a full-time editor. Um, he's been working for me for three or four years now. Awesome. Um, then I've got a few different people that just like cover events for me. And then every once in a while, I'll just send a camera to somebody. If they have like a really cool event and I just can't make it to it, I'll send them a camera and just like see what they come up with. And, you know, if yeah. it's not much good stuff or that's not good quality, we'll just use the shorts on something. And so I just try to keep content coming all the time because when you have a, a full-time editor and, and he runs out of footage to do, you don't want to sit there and pay him to sit on his butt all week. So you got to make sure you keep content coming in. And yeah, exactly. uh, that's worked out pretty good. And very tough to get an editor um, just because going, I mean, this is a, this is a, a point of contention for a lot of YouTubers who start out doing their own editing is how hard was it for you to find an editor who kind of understood your voice and what you were trying to do and how you wanted it produced? Uh, it's actually a funny story because uh, my editor was my next door neighbor from college. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> Dude, I randomly, loud ass <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I randomly was going on a trip. We were still friends at the time. And uh, I was going on a trip with one of my vehicles and was just going to drive right by his house. And whoever was going to ride with me that day had backed out or whatever. So I had an open seat. I was like, hey, man, you want to go ride? I'm going here and I'm taking my vehicle. Um, I can pick you up if you want to go. He's like, hey, yeah, let's go. And so we just got talking on the way. And I was like, man, I just really I need to find somebody that can edit. And he had helped me on a DVD before. Um, that I worked on when I was um, still staying down there in college and uh, and knew how to do editing and he had a musical background so he knew how to match you know music with everything and all that stuff and and uh, he was like yeah and, you know what Ron really liking his job at the time and I was like look man you know if you, if you want to try to do something like this like let's see see if we can make it happen and eventually hired him full-time and it's worked out really well he, he loves his job he's got like two kids and the whole family and and it makes it where he can spend time with them and then, you know, still get his job done and, and work on edits and stuff. And sometimes he edits stuff so good that I'm just like, you need to get out of my head. I don't know how you knew how to do that, but <laughs> it's freaking perfect. And like sometimes he just nails stuff like that. And then sometimes he'll get like some really weird Mickey Mouse like song uh, off art list. And I'm like, no, try a new song. <laughs> what are we doing here, buddy? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah no, it, and that's what I said. Like, it's so hard to, it's so hard to have somebody who understands your vision. And what you right. want to do and how you want to produce. That's why I was curious because that's where a lot of a lot of folks might get hung up. Um, you know, if if they're you know doing their editing and they want to, maybe they're pretty far down their YouTube career and they want to pass it off to an editor. It's a very difficult thing to do. So good, awesome that you found a guy who you know got a spot on. You know, figured yeah. it out. And, and communication um, is important too about that stuff. You know, you, you always want to keep you know saying, hey, this is working good. You know this is what's doing good on this, you know, other channels or this episode did, did good because of this. Like we're always trying to look back on videos that did really well and learn and know why, you know, why that did so well. And a lot of that for us is just talking more as, as hard as it is to do. Like we'll go on a, a trip and I've filmed all the cool stuff, but I haven't talked about anything. And so, you know, people, viewers, I feel like want to, they want to see you talk about it or, or have some, snippets in and there and having good characters and stuff like who we go trail riding with makes a big difference because if we got a group of like 12 people and i don't know half of them it doesn't turn out as good but if there's like five of us and we're all like really close and giving each other a hard time the whole time like those videos do really well because there's a lot of you know meandering back and forth and, and talking talking smack so it makes it a little more interesting yeah definitely yeah, the yeah, banter adds to it for it. sure yeah. so one one thing so you've you've talked about facebook Amazon Prime, YouTube, all the other social medias, which are shorter clips. Facebook and Amazon Prime, you use a different platform on like uh, the, you know, exporting to like uh, what Facebook is a, a vertical video or a square video or something different, right? So do you have to re-edit for Facebook? And are you releasing independent Facebook information or, or content? Or is it like just link to the youtube video and go from there how do you how uh, do you do that so we we do for a while we were doing just like teasers and stuff on facebook and then just at the end we just have a little thing that popped up and said check out our youtube channel to watch the rest and we would do like three or four minute long you know teaser um but recently i've gotten into i'll video on my cell phone so i got a, a camera rig that holds my camera mic everything and then i have a spot for my cell phone so i'll just hit record on my cell phone while i'm hitting record on the camera and a lot of times, you know, those videos will do way better than the YouTube videos. Like for some reason, Facebook just likes mobile, mobile content. So if you upload it from your phone, it does really well. I don't know why. Yeah, it's interesting. Like 
how every one of those platforms uses different because um early on we had randy santel uh he's a professional eater um he has a million <laughs> subscribers on or f- followers on on facebook and he actually his editor edits the video for youtube and then edits the same video and releases it independently on facebook because they use two different formats so i didn't know if you were using a similar strategy to that and so then you you've chosen how you get videos onto each platform what about amazon prime and how does that fill into it and that's paid content right so is the production quality different? I don't know. I don't want to lift the skirt too high, but like, you know, is, is that different content? Is this like, are you using different videos? Is this a little bit more edited and series based? How are you choosing what goes on Amazon prime? As, so prime's more like professional, more series type stuff. So like the death wish show, we try to make it more TV like, and that's the right. main one that we have on there. And then I always try to like try other shows on there too, to see what, see how they do. Um, but it's, it's basically the same content. It's just edited a little differently to make Amazon happy because they are very strict when it comes to what content can go on their platform and you have to do captions and all this other stuff. So it's a lot of work, but I mean, once you get it on there, it's, it's just one of those things that you can tell a sponsor that you have a YouTube channel with all this other stuff and TikTok, blah, blah, blah. But you mentioned Amazon prime. They're like, you're on Amazon prime. Oh, so. Yeah. The Amazon prime thing is funny to me because. Um, I, I almost feel they're falling into a similar pitfall and maybe they need to branch off with another piece of Amazon prime, um, that can competes more with YouTube. Cause as we just talked about, people are starting to like the raw videos. We're going back. There's this weird split right now that we're having. It's a dovetail of like, there's your kind of raw regular production videos. And then there's people who are going out and creating car track, you know, the folks that we've been talking to. So this is, it's a weird stance that Amazon doesn't. I mean, I'm sure they understand the numbers behind it, but I'm curious why they wouldn't take a more, you know, raw format video. I don't have they. Maybe they're they studio based. Maybe though. you can, but I, I, I know, but I, I feel like maybe they're missing out on like a huge opportunity of people are already yeah. subscribed to Amazon. They got Amazon Prime. How do you not have a spinoff that's just a competitor to YouTube where it's a little more yeah. raw, you know, videos? Yeah, I agree 100% because it's, it's also hard too because you got to sift through all this content that might be lower quality than what you're expecting to find on amazon prime well, if there was another place just for that content it would be a lot easier plus it would give a place for other creators to post stuff because i mean that's that's our idea is we just try to put we take the same content and try to put it everywhere you know yeah yeah that's imagine and um, i imagine well mike you're talking about exports and i'm just used to the video world where you're like all right i have my final product and i'm just going to export it in 10 different ways for whatever yeah. platform yeah you know you're going to have your vertical shots and your your horizontal and your, your regulars that you just crop out and have your output settings for that. That's all you JP. Um, I'm, I'm I have still a, on the I windows a, movie maker phase of my life. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, like I, was self-taught. That. <laughs> I was self-taught in Adobe and premiere pro and after effects and all that. So you, you, you learn quickly uh, and thanks to YouTube for uh, having everybody's content on there to learn that from. Um, one thing I really want to dive into, and I think this might be the most dangerous sport that you cover um without a doubt is um these barbie jeep races that you guys are (laughs) are it's not a matter of when it's a matter of how bad i mean people what's is this still going on or did you guys is this canceled are you guys still doing this because those things were crazy yeah it's it's still going on there's one uh there's one coming up this next big event i'm going to so it's a nine day long event it's got all kinds of different (laughs) off-roading and racing and stuff and they actually have a barbecue race um i actually got into that because i was participating in the races and Excellent. started winning a bunch and what was think, the car what was your car choice what did you have uh i think the best one is i have a john deere gator ended up being yeah. like my favorite because i would just take the bed off and then just put something on the bed like where the bed was to give it traction and i could kind of move mm-hmm. around a lot but i don't know they're, yeah. they're, they're like ticking time bombs because at some point on your way down the hill it might not be your first run it might not be your second run, but at some point it's just going to fall apart. And you don't know if you're going to end up in a tree, in the crowd, but you have no idea. So it's, it's sketchy, but it's probably the best adrenaline rush you can get for the money. Cause I mean, you got nothing in a barbie Jeep and then you just tear it apart, make it where it'll freewheel down the hill and throw on some pads and a helmet and have a blast. It's incredible content. It's uh, extremely <laughs> dangerous and I encourage it. I think it's awesome. I, I watched a bunch of them and that's where I realized I was like, Oh, I've seen one of these. 
it, and I don't know what it was, but I was on Instagram or something. And it was uh, I hate that new meme where it's like, this is what they're doing now, whatever that like girl's voice is. Um, but it was like, our friends are having a Barbie race. And I was like, no, I've seen this before. And I looked it up on YouTube and it was your channel. I was like, oh, I was like, well, he's covered a bunch of these. You've been covering them for like 10 years. Right. And yeah, there was a, there was a couple of big events every year where like, that was just kind of the sideshow of the off-road events is us going and, and Barbie Jeep racing a bunch of grown men on these little kids toys. And, yeah, kind of get the brand. Uh, the content always did really good. They were really good back in the day. And I guess there's just like, that's kind of caught on. So now there's a lot of different places that have the races and so it's just not not as big anymore as far as views and good and stuff yeah goes. that's making sense now I as far as like 20 as far million as was... views of barbie jeeps on just your channel like yeah. i'm looking 3.3 3.1 2.2 2 it, it it goes for a while yeah crazy thing is i won most of this they're on my channel <laughs> good for you i mean that's fantastic um didn't like wasn't it on like jackass weren't they doing that too like i, I forget one of those shows i feel like they were doing those i think those cky races. did a cky maybe, maybe the old yeah, they might have done that but that, that, that it, it fits the era that you're showing like 14 yep. 12 13 you know that's that's the cky era so um so what's your prediction on on you know how many Barbie Jeep events are you entering this year and how many do you plan on winning? Let's just get that out there right now. Uh, so I don't know. I, uh, I guess two years ago, I, uh, wrecked on a mountain bike in Utah going about 20 miles an hour and, uh, separated my shoulder and had surgery and I, that sucked. And I don't really want to have to do that again, yeah. especially for Barbie Jeep racing. So I haven't, <laughs> I haven't Barbie Jeep raced since then. So I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm retiring. I still mountain bike. But I don't yeah. know if I'm retiring for barbecue pricing or if I'm just going to have to, like, step in there and show everybody I still got it at some point. I don't know. Yeah. Because of what the pay, okay. payout is at this oh, event coming out this weekend. Just let him know. Yeah, you're the guy. He's on waivers right now. He's not sure if he's going to get back in. He's on IR, <laughs> but he might, he might pop in. I just, you know, returning yeah. champion. That's I mean, Jordan came sure back at some that. point. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone's <laughs> going to have a comeback. So, and I, th I think it could be it. Um, that's what you need is like a very serious comeback documentary to Barbie Jeep racing. Yes. That... That's your next, that's your next series is like that's the... You know, the slow motion. It's like you working out and like stripping the Barbie Jeep in your garage. Yes. <laughs> and then you're like, it's like, you know, it's very like dr dramatized. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's it. I think that's just think about it. The title just and thumbnail to that could could just be amazing like come back to the world's greatest sport ever yep. after I actually had so espn does like espn the ocho or whatever like just to be funny yeah. and like comes out all these crazy sports they actually approached us about like doing a serious piece about barbecue racing we never could like get an agreement figured out but they really wanted us to do a piece it would have been really 30, cool 30 for 30 I, I, I want to see the racing piece. with matt yeah yeah i want to see the piece but i don't necessarily need to see it through espn even though ESPN Ocho has a you know a special place in my heart from uh, Ron Burgundy, I believe. Like, yeah, or no, what? No, Dodgeball, Dodgeball, the movie. Oh. Yeah, it's like we're on ESPN the Ocho. Um, I, you know, I never had the realization until right now, JP. I also uh, watched a ton. I'm looking through your videos, and there's a bunch of red lines on all the Barbie Jeep racing. Uh, nice. I've watched a ton of them, and I had no idea. I think I found your channel through the Mega Tank video. And then, uh, cause I was just searching like how to upgrade the tank on my car, which I would never do. Cause I'm about as handy with vehicles as, uh, I don't know, nothing. Yeah. Workshop that reference, but not too handy. Yeah. Like, okay. This is like last week. I'm not good with the hands. I'm not good with the, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I just didn't know what to do. And I saw it and I was like, Oh, a thousand miles on a tank. Yeah. That could be great. Nah, I'm not going to do that. But I did plastic dip my bumpers. That was cool. Um, thanks, Monty, for all fairness, the last time I was with you, you almost ran out of gas with your child in the car. So just yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Frequently, um, I run that line pretty heavily. So this tank could really help me. <laughs> so, so Matt, also, um, so the Barbie Jeep racing, I just think that's like one of the funniest ones, and it does get a lot of it gets a lot of eyeballs. But you cover, I mean, how many different events are there? Because you're doing a lot of hill climbs, you're doing a bunch of these other events. I mean, what's what's kind of like the list of the events? that are into this like i guess more of a hardcore like off-roading yeah so uh we do the mega trucks which are like the big it's like a monster truck with smaller tires and usually more power um and it's more like privateer people that are built on themselves uh we cover a lot of that um we were covering a lot of formula off-road which is what guys in like scandinavia and stuff do it's like mm -hmm. pal tires hill climb kind of stuff uh, of course the rock bouncers 
Um, UTV stuff's gotten really big in the last few years. So we cover a good bit of that too. And of course we got the death of a show and a few other little spin off things like that. Um, but for the most part, that's what all we, we cover. Do you go to the UTV, uh, like long jumping events? I just saw that on, uh, on, uh, what's inside the guy went to like this, this guy was trying to break the world record. It was like 200 something. It was huge. I don't I don't even want to guess. Do you go to that kind of stuff as well? A lot of stuff's on the West Coast, and so I don't make it to a lot of that. Um, but I've, doing, I've been to things like that. I've been to some doing stuff. We just don't we just don't get an opportunity to do a lot of that. Of course, you know, like I said before, we have a a shop now where we we build a lot of these vehicles, you know, in house, and so that takes up a, a good bit of my time too. Make sure we cover all that content and, and things like that. And uh, I don't want to uh, once again lift up the skirt too much, but uh, we were talking before we were recording about another purchase that you've been working on. Um, will that purchase allow you to get further and build in more content, uh, like get out to the West Coast a lot easier and towing and trailering things? I don't know if you've released that onto your channel yet. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Um, so, I mean, I, I've got a, a toter home that I bought um, to hopefully. So I basically bought it really good condition as far as the drivetrain, but the interior had like green carpet from the 80s or something and i don't know what they were thinking like halfway up the walls and everything so i've been like completely stripping it down and redoing the interior so it's so it's something nice to stay in um but the goal of that is to have something that i can travel across the country and instead of trying to find a hotel i can just pull over at truck stop sleep for the night and and uh, i'm gonna try to get a custom trailer built for it too so we can haul some rigs around and i'm actually building so i had a rock bouncer for a while and then when we started the shop me and my business partner both sold them um so we could afford to do the shop and everything and uh i'm finally to the point now is this three years later to where i'm gonna build one for myself so we just started on it my chassis is almost done and uh our goal is to have a big enough trailer where we can put a couple of them in there and just like start traveling around you know showing them off because we build them for customers now so we want to go show them off show people what they could do and, and go trail ride a bunch of cool places in them and so yeah. interiors must be, uh, you're talking about the interior of this tote room. That, that must be a, a new uh, entry into your you know, repertoire of things you can do because uh, just scrolling through your thumbnails, there's not much interiors to the vehicles that you're typically <laughs> in, right? So well, how, I mean, how, how was that shift to it? I was in building science and built houses, you know, That's growing great. up. So, so <laughs> it's all, I'm, I'm pretty handy on that stuff too. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I did like ship lap on the inside and um, some nice hardwood type floor in it. And so trying to make it, trying to make it nice where somebody walks in there like, Oh, okay. It's kind of cool. I guess it's, <laughs> okay. it's, uh, it's not like a, it's, it's, it's much more like a home than it is a vehicle. Right. No, so that, that makes sense. Home. Yeah. yeah. What about, what about detailing? I know because you guys are out here. I mean, I don't know how, into detailing these communities are but we have you know we talk to people in the car industry who are diehard detailers um are you into the detail side of things or just like leave the mud on it we're good yeah i don't ever watch anything <laughs> that's, that's what i thought that's what i thought i'll wash my truck like maybe once a year and then um the toter home i'll go through a truck wash and get them to wash the truck and trailer every like, once a year that's about it so it's gonna oh, be bad for me to watch something but that's why I like white vehicles. So they don't show it. They're not dirty that bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a smart move. Um, um, God, I, I had something on that too. Not the detail. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. So when you talk about this rock bounce, uh, rock bouncer, is that what you call them? Is that the official, yeah. like kind of the, the term you guys call? What's the typical platform? Um, I know we, you know, there's, there's quite a few, like, I guess, car focused people who also watch this podcast who kind of love understanding just platforms. It's like, obviously you're building these cages or maybe you're getting a cage and you're welding them together. But what about like the drivetrain and like engine platforms that you're starting with these rock bouncers? Because I'm yeah, curious so if they vary or if everybody's like, oh, I do an LS3 or something like that. Um, so they kind of vary for different people. And there's not a lot of people that build them for customers uh, like we do. But basically everything that we put in them, we build basically in-house. And most everything's brand new. So we start out with a poly tubing and uh, build a full chassis and do all the suspension and everything. All that stuff's CAD design. And uh, we put LS3 as our base model engine. Of course, we have LS3 408 stroker, 427, and we can put a blower on any of those. So we just finished one not long ago that uh, had a 427 with a blower on it. It was pretty rowdy. Um, of course, they have TH400 transmissions that are built to make a lot or take a lot of power. And then we'll run either straight drive transfer case or custom transfer case. And then we custom build axles. So we'll take a rear end out of a 
three quarter and one ton Chevrolet and build them into a front axle so they can steer. And then a lot of times we'll do rear steer as well. Yeah. Just like a monster truck. Yeah. You got to have that. No as things, much articulation no. as you can. Right. And right. articulation in left and right, not side to side. Yeah. Right. Those things yeah, we, take so much, there's so much abuse, you know? Right. Yeah. We build them to take a beating. And that's, that's one of the things like the, the razors and stuff have gotten so popular in the last few years, but they're, they're spending like 30, 35 grand. And then you got to, add stuff to that to build them. and our, our yeah. turnkey rock bouncers that don't break and you don't have to modify them when you get them they're 80 grand out the door for uh yeah. you know brand new and ready to go so how, how long you guys been how long did you guys go into you know we said hey we're gonna start you know building these tell us about that a little bit um so it's funny thing funny thing about me is if you hang out with me long enough i'll try to talk you into quitting your day job and um and, and working for yourself as well and uh, that's kind of what i do with a business partner his name is jake Berge. Um i met him out on the trail wheeling and uh he ended up getting into racing he had a construction background as well got into racing kind of built his own vehicle and modified it a bunch and at the time um, tech videos were getting big and nobody was doing them for these two chassis mm -hmm. vehicles and so i was like look man i'll send you a camera um find a topic you want to cover talk <laughs> about it i'll edit it and we'll see how they do and so through that series, he basically become the, became the go-to guru when it came to, you know, technology in these vehicles. And so eventually I was like, look, you know, you know, we could do something. You could build them for other people. And he started selling parts um, on the side to kind of fund his racing and everything. And eventually we just kind of brought it under the bus knuckle off-road umbrella and, and started uh, started building for customers and selling parts and got him to move from Augusta, Georgia to Coleman, Alabama, where I live. And the rest kind of history got shop and now we're i think we're building nine this year we're hoping to do 12 uh full turnkey rigs next year man that's awesome um and are you guys are you doing that on another channel or is this all you know where where all where all is all of this content you know located where are you putting all this content is this some of the stuff you're putting on prime what, what's going on here right uh right now it's on our normal youtube channel as far as the builds go um we still do some tech stuff on another channel it's called bus knuckle off road and that's mostly just like basically shop only stuff we'll, we'll do some stuff about you know additions we're doing to the shop when we get new equipment in stuff like that just so people get a better a better idea of what we're doing at the shop yeah, yeah because there's there's so much content that we do that it's almost too much to be able to put it on the the big channel as well so we just try to trying to make it where it's got its own little place yeah and the shop stuff you kind of just forget to do like i changed uh, spark plugs on my audi s4 the other day and i was like i should have filmed that and just put it on my youtube and i don't know why i didn't film it at all because it's a very yeah. easy process but i was like you know what that's the stuff you got to put on because it just gets traction over time but right. uh, sometimes that's you just forget when you're in that you know you're like oh, i'm just doing this, this and this you're like did you film it you're like oh no i just kind of got in the zone right kind of got in the zone and blew it missed it <laughs> Well, I mean, it, that was great to learn the process of how you got to where you are. The only other question I have is like, it seems that from the beginning to now, thumbnails have become very different for you. And so like, my final question would be like, how important has the thumbnail come today? And what lessons have you learned over the past, you know, now 14 years of making videos? Because a thumbnail hasn't hasn't changed really it was the cover shot of your video right what was going to go on the front cover of that video that was your thumbnail back in the dvd days now you're doing thumbnails so what have you learned throughout the, the 14 years of making videos for thumbnails uh the good thing now is is that you can test different thumbnails so a lot of times we'll uh -huh. we'll make three different ones you know and test them and see if, if one's not gaining traction you see a lot of other youtube channels doing this especially like Liz mcfarlane and people like that like if, if they put a video out and it doesn't gain the traction they're used to they'll swap that thumbnail out and then there's a lot of places where you can you can actually test it as well yeah um, tube buddy so do, you, do you use tube buddy i do yeah yeah tube buddy's great uh our friend david manning uh taught us about that where you know you can do a b testing which is very very much engineering based you know getting some analytics based on it how many clicks is it going how much time are they watching it the benefit of youtube is that that whole thing so I, i'm glad that you said that because it's difficult right it is one of the harder things to crack and based on time of day time of year what's going on in the world it could change so i like that you come in with three do you save those three like if the video ended up ends up going downhill later on do you ever change the thumbnail like six months later uh i don't think we ever changed one six months later um a lot of times we'll use different 
thumbnails on different platforms too because we have okay. people that are, are on diff, um, all kinds of different platforms like you might watch it on youtube but you might still be likely to click on it if it's a different thumbnail on facebook so hmm. we kind of we kind of put different stuff different places and one will perform That's, great on facebook and not do good on youtube and so all that stuff's kind of different too but uh, a lot of people don't spend enough time on thumbnails i think thumbnails are very important i mean it's the it's the cover of your book and whether or not yeah. somebody wants to check it out absolutely yeah I imagine your audiences just have to vary so much. You know, Mike and I were talking about this earlier today, even like um, just the audience between Facebook and YouTube and these other platforms are very, I would, I would say they're different. They got it. They have to be. I think your YouTube audience has got to be a little bit different than your Facebook audience. Yeah. Like there's diehard YouTubers like myself and Mike, who 95% of the content that we absorb is YouTube on its own. I don't even have a Facebook account. So do you notice any difference between the two? I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I'm I still think, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I still think Facebook is not a place for long form content. So like if we do a race video and it's say it's two hills and on YouTube, we do the, the full race and it's 20 minutes long. Well, a lot of times we'll cut that down and make two separate videos for Facebook because I just think the the like no one really gets on Facebook and says, you know, I'm gonna watch a 20 minute video. Good people get on YouTube to do that. But and another thing is like Facebook still, I mean, obviously Google's the best search engine ever made. So Google's got that and Facebook still, no one gets on Facebook and searches how to fix this, you know? And so that's kind of a barrier to that too. So it's, I don't know, it's, they're just different platforms. You kind of, kind of treat them a little differently when you upload yeah. different stuff. Definitely. I th I, Facebook's a good place for, I guess, groups and things like that. Like these yeah. niche car groups every once in a while, like I'll, I'll try to log in and go look at them. But um, the, yeah, other than that, the localization yeah. of content, like if you want to buy something, you want to go on a run, you want to go on a mountain biking, or I'm sure, I'm sure your local team members can get traction in their local rock climbing or rock uh, crawling and off-roading and outdoors kind of groups they can post content to that, but it's not going to get you a hundred million views like it would through YouTube. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think we've covered quite a bit of what one thing we always ask. Um, yeah. Are there channels right now that you're watching on YouTube or is there anybody you follow on YouTube that you draw on for inspiration from? Is there, you know, is there certain channels that you just watch for fun that are outside of completely outside of what you, you know, you focus on um what what's what's your uh what's your searches like look like on youtube yeah who do you follow? um i definitely watch a lot of Cleus mcfarland um just because yeah, he's quickly became one of the biggest automotive channels on youtube yep. and i mean i don't do anything with drag racing or anything like that i just think uh his content's pretty cool of course the the jet boats i'm gonna build one of those eventually as well because yep. they're just freaking awesome i live on the lake so it just makes sense and uh <laughs> absolutely that's easy for you and you got the equipment yes yeah, right. as long as you don't blind yourself like they did when they welded them together you'll be fine. right <laughs> i hope you get a wrap they like that bad, so i mean they did pretty good yeah. and uh of course i watched like peter mckinnon and a couple other you know different channels and stuff like that just to kind of get the whole artsy you know video stuff and because that stuff's still interesting to me as well uh, i might not yeah. use a lot of it but there's still like you know, tips and tricks that you find in there that you might use, like making a good cell phone video um, yep. that you wouldn't think of. So I just try to stay up to date with all that stuff and see what's working, what's getting traction, you know, in the market. I watch some Hoonigan stuff, um, side by side blog. A lot of people like I'll go on these trips with like Polaris and, and things like that and, and meet a lot of these guys. So I don't follow their YouTube channel to kind of keep up and see what's yeah, going see, on with them. See like a JH diesel or something out there in the wild and those guys. Yeah, they're all fun. And they, they seem like such a good community too. I, at the automotive community, uh, regardless of whether it's off-road, drag racing, drifting, like it's uh, there, everyone's kind of together on it, you know, which is really nice about the community there. Um, so always, always interesting to watch. I think, yeah, well, you know, they're also, they're also going to the dunes. I think they go to Glamis and a couple other places where they're out there quite a bit. I know Cletus and Boosted Boys and all of them are out there all the time. Uh, it'd be interesting to see you mix it up with those guys. I'm sure, especially with one of your, uh, you got to, you, what you should do is just get those guys out there, do some rock claw, crawling, you know, or do the, uh, the, I still don't know the name, rock bounce, whatever. I don't know. That's uh, an aggressive, <laughs> seems like an aggressive term. Um, but once I watch it, I'm like, oh, that's, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Cause you're literally yeah. bouncing off of rock. It, it, it's mesmerizing. I mean, I, 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 I'm just like shocked. I, I would be so scared doing it. 
Yeah, it's wild. I mean, people take basically look at something and we do these things called bounty hills and they'll look at something and say, you know, there'll be 20 people that are trying to hit this hill and you'll, there'll be 20 people. The first 19 will roll down and destroy stuff and break everything. And that 20th guy, he's not going to quit. He's going to hit it too. It's just, I don't know. It's it's different breed. It's a nuts nuts community. (laughs) And when you get into the hill climb people, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, all right, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And some people make it look real easy. Yeah. And some people don't. Um, I have a, I have one, I have one more question for you. Do you respect a four wheeler going up a hill more if it's two stroke or four stroke? Uh, I don't know. I guess it's kind of the same to me. Um, I I respect when a four wheeler goes up a hill compared to if a dirt bike goes up a hill because a four wheeler has got a lot more to lose. Yeah. Big two-stroke guy. I love seeing a good two-stroke. Uh, when you see a CR, when you see a CR two fifty whipping up a, a hill climb, that's always that's always good for me. Yeah, uh, you have to check out. Yeah. We got a new series called Hill Killers, and it's uh, a bunch of guys from Ohio that are on dirt bikes and quads. And, uh, they go. I travel with them different places, and they just try just ignorant yeah. climbs. Yeah, there was. Well, that's a, this, this is a, probably a good place to end it. I think typically yeah. what we do here is we say, um, let us know. You know, obviously, let them know the channels, the different channels that you have up, where they can watch your content. Um, you know, your your social handles as well, um, and then what's coming up? What can we expect from Busted Knuckle going forward? And um, yeah, the the floor is yours. Cool. Yeah, if you want some more videos, Busted Knuckle video or Busted Knuckle Off Road on YouTube. Uh, of course, all of our social media handles are at Busted Knuckle Films and. Stay tuned because we got a lot of really cool content, really cool builds, and uh, a lot of trail riding, a lot of racing. And we've got a nine day event coming up that's going to be ridiculous, including some barbecue racing. I may or, might, may, or may not enter. We'll see. Well, may or may not. That. You heard it here well, first. May or may not, reigning champion, may or may not come back to take the, uh, the king. I don't know if they call it king of the hill. Um, I don't know how you guys even that if it's just it's queen, it's queen of the mud you just make it without breaking your collarbone i'm not sure which one <laughs> how you i'm not sure how you win the barber jeep race but i i think at some point we need the dramatic comeback video for the barbie, yeah. day, barbie race yeah I don't know if you have time for it now but put it put it in the put it on the whiteboard because that's gonna be electric I'd love um to no uh, appreciate you so much for coming on uh thank you so much again go to bust knuckle check out some of the content um, you're going to get on the page. You're going to realize you've probably already watched a ton of it. You just didn't realize that he had a full page all the way through full, full of it. So, um, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no problem. And so everything is linked below, so make sure you go down and follow it. I know immediately after this, I am going to go watch uh, at least the first two out of two videos of uh, Hell Killers because it looks really cool. And... Uh, uh, episode number two is in Pennsylvania, so I appreciate you for that. Uh, I very well could have gone, but it looks like Pennsylvania. I'm just going to say that. The, the thumbnail. <laughs> you did a good job of capturing the essence of PA. Uh, I have a feeling I've been to that place, but it could just be Pennsylvania, so who knows. Um, so thanks so much for coming. Everything is linked below, and uh, I want to also thank uh, Fonzie and Dip Your Car for sponsoring today's episode. So thanks, everyone. Uh, stay tubular, and we'll catch you next week.